Welcome to The Determined Mom Show, the only marketing podcast dedicated to guiding mom CEOs into tranquility, wealth, and multiplying those precious moments. Welcome to this episode of The Determined Mom Show. I am here with David Delisle, and he is the author of The Golden Quest, and it is an amazing graphic novel for kids to learn about money. So welcome, David. Hi, Amanda. So happy to be here. Yeah, I'm I'm excited to have you. And the topic that we're going to be talking about is why you shouldn't teach your kids to save money. So I am pretty excited about uh, diving into this because that's a very unusual take on, you know, finances and money and teaching kids. So very excited about that. But before we dive in, please tell us about you. Yeah. So yeah, I'm excited about that too, because it's uh, a little different than the way we we tend to think about money. So for myself, I mean, really, I started my journey really young. I was into learning about money and reading about finance when I was like 10 or 11 and reading these different books. So I've always been interested and fascinated with this idea of, of money and making money and investing money and sort of seeing that story evolve over the years and now as a parent with two young boys realizing that I want to sort of pass on what I've learned what I've what I've seen and and also really surprisingly how much of money isn't as tricky as it needs to be I mean I made it trickier because I really wanted to get in the weeds and learn about it and do all these things but it doesn't have to be and all of that really is noise and not what really is important. So what I try to do is figure out what is really important. What do I want to teach my boys? How do I teach my boys? Mm -hmm. And that's when I realized most of what we have out there and the way we think about it, that's part of the problem. And that's what's so tricky is we really don't understand it. And that led me to writing this book and and trying to just simplify the the whole thing to really what is important. That's awesome. I love a your passion for finances and and money and numbers. I think I think it takes like a certain brain to have that kind of passion. And I love that there are people out there like you to help people like me learn about this stuff and figure it all out. So thank you. And um, the other thing is that I find it very interesting that you chose to make a graphic novel. I think it's ingenious because all of the other books about money are like, they might be, they might have like a cartoon picture on a page or something like that, but to actually, you know, write an interesting book for kids about money, I think is like absolutely insanely genius. I love it. Yeah. Well, uh, and I'll back it up from the graphic novel a bit, just how you're talking about the numbers. Mm -hmm. And, and that's almost what led me to the graphic novel is because when we think about money, we think about math, we think about numbers, we think of complication, and it scares people away. So I even see you hesitating a bit, because when I talk about money, people are like, yeah, I don't want to talk about money. Definitely don't want to talk about math. And, and that's what I meant by the noise is money includes all those things. But really, the what we want to learn about it is habits and mindset, which have nothing to do with math at all. And that's why it led so well to a graphic novel, because it's really a story and it's a story about how you teach about manners or anything else that we want to teach our kids. It's not a lecture. It doesn't mm-hmm. require charts and math. And it can be written. I mean, all of these messages in their purest form, a five-year-old can grasp. And that's the beauty of it. It's not as complicated as we, we make it out to be. Mm-hmm. But it's that complication, that fear, which sort of perpetuates all of this misinformation and and why it's such a, a tricky subject. And not only is it tricky, it's it's taboo in a lot of ways. I mean, we don't yeah. talk about money. Yep. And I think at least in the US, there's a lot of cultural <clears throat> things that go into that. Like, you know, like it's impolite to ask how much someone makes, or it's impolite to um, you know, I don't know, there's just a lot of taboo about it in in probably in Canada too, I'm assuming, but, um, there's just a lot of like social, socially acceptable things to talk about. And money is never on that list, but it really should be, you know, 
we should, I feel like we should have those classes in high school, at least, you know, um, if not elementary school and middle school, just to kind of get us started. So maybe that could be added to your list of things to do. Yeah. I mean, for (laughs) sure. And, and that's, so it is impolite to talk about it because it makes people feel uncomfortable Mm -hmm. because we tie up so much self-worth and value in money. And that's what I'm trying to, to change is that it's, it doesn't have to be that, that way. And, and even though, you know, I wouldn't ask you how much you make and those things still might be a little impolite and regular conversation Mm -hmm. at the very least with our children, within our family, within our household, we should be talking about those things. And that's, that's what happens is we, we don't talk out, talk about it outside of the house. And then inside the house, we sort of bring that inside as well and say, we don't talk about it. So then our kids, I mean, they have no reference point. They have no idea. They don't know how much we make as parents. We don't know how much we spend on them. We don't, they don't know how much their vacation costs or their, their lunch, or if we eat out, they just don't know those things. And then, and then we sort of lay it on them, like make good money decisions. And why are you buying that? And why are you wasting your money? when it has no meaning to them because they don't there's it's all relative they don't know what what things actually cost yeah and and why they should make certain choices because we just haven't talked to about talked to them about it that's a really really good point and it's just kind of setting them up to expect something from them that you want but not showing them how to you know to get it it's like okay make this cake here's the stuff you know <laughs> like that's not gonna work so I love that you put it like that yeah and that's and that's what I'm trying to do is it's really a, an awareness and the more we're aware of of these things what things cost how we feel about money and just have more of open discussion around it it stops being this this thing that we sort of put our head in the ground and try to ignore and then it finds its way to take over our lives and we don't know why. Yeah. Very, very quickly. Right. It happens. Um, so my question is why shouldn't we teach our kids to save money? This is like the, the hot topic here. Yeah. Well, it's funny. Cause I, I found anytime I would talk to, to parents about the, you know, money or teaching kids about money or the book and what I was doing, they get very excited and say, this is great because I need to teach my kids how to save. Um, and that's what came up over and over and over again. And I felt the same thing as how do I teach my kids to save? But as I played with this idea a little bit more, what I realized is again, because we don't fully understand how much of it is just our relationship with money. That's actually key and, and something that we should focus on first. So before the saving, we should be thinking about the relationship. And if we just focus on the saving first, what happens is inadvertently what we're teaching our kids by not meaning to is save, but the whole reason we're teaching them to save is so you can buy something more expensive down the road. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's really the, the core. Save yeah. this so eventually you can, you know, buy this bigger toy or as they get older, pay for college or a car or a house. And it's all this idea of save so you can have more later. Mm-hmm. And then as adults, we feel the same way. So we're constantly, even the the people who are really good savers, they're stuck in this feeling of what am I going to buy once I save enough? Yeah. And so we're always in this position of feeling like we don't have what we want. We see it in front of us. We have this feeling of lack. We're striving for more. We're saving for it. And then once we get that, then we save for the next thing. And then we save for the next thing. So there's just this endless saving for more. And so it's not so much that saving in itself is bad. Mm -hmm. It's that when we teach them, we're not teaching them the full lesson. Yeah. And the full lesson would be, why are you saving? And if it's just to buy more, you'll never save enough. Yeah. So I try to flip it with, let's teach first the why and really teach about that relationship with money. And then, then the saving can come once you know why you're even saving. Yeah. That's awesome. And it's kind of like mindset and, mindfulness kind of wrapped in there is that what I'm understanding like kind of like getting that thinking about money and thinking about things and thinking about spending and saving and all those things in the correct uh kind of places in your brain yeah in the correct order because what Mm -hmm. happens like I said if you if we don't teach that piece then there's never enough and there's always just 
saving for more and more and more. But if we start with that piece, so rather than teaching our kids to save as our first lesson, why would they want to spend that money in the first place? What's important to them? What do they want to spend it on? What, what do they really want? And not only want, what brings them joy? Because they want everything. Yeah. But once they start reflecting, like you, you, you nailed it when you talk about mindfulness. Once we start reflecting on things and sitting on it, we start realizing how much we just buy out of habit or because the next thing to do or buy rather than it's something that really brings us joy. Yeah. And what's really neat. So um, uh, you mentioned, you're going to mention a bit in the title about the awesome stuff. Mm -hmm. And that's really what I get excited about because the awesome stuff, even a five-year-old gets that the awesome stuff is what really brings you joy and lights you up. And the more you sit on it, the more you start reflecting on what is important, what isn't. So then with little kids, rather than saying, save that money, put it away, and we'll buy something bigger later, when they're looking at something, you can start asking them, is that your awesome stuff? Yeah. And you'll see even, even these five-year-olds, they'll hold it in their hands, they'll look at it, they'll contemplate it. It's that whole mindfulness you mentioned, and then make a decision. And as parents, we know they're not going to always make the decisions we want them to make. Right. Their awesome stuff is going to be different than our awesome stuff. But that doesn't matter. It's the fact that they reflected on it and thought, oh, do I, do I really want this ice cream? Or is mm -hmm. it just, I'm just in the habit of just asking for stuff and wanting anything I see. Yeah. And, and they, they'll make that decision. Some will say, no, I'd rather have this or I'd save, or that's not really that important. Mm -hmm. Some will go after that and realize this is more important. It's, but it's that mindfulness and that pausing, because then that habit, if we think of ourselves as adults, we fall into the same habit, seeing something and just feeling like I want to buy it. I want to buy it. I want to buy it rather than what, what really is important to you? What, what are some of the things you've spent money on that, have brought you that joy what's your awesome stuff yeah and it's and it's really fun sitting on that because i found as well usually what we think is our awesome stuff isn't necessarily what what we thought it was mm -hmm. and when we do realize what our awesome stuff is that's probably not where we're spending our money yeah so what is the criteria for awesome stuff like if i'm in the store and i'm holding something how do I know if it's my awesome stuff? So that's a great, great question. And that's the same question the boy basically comes up with in, in the story. I mean, he's thinking everything he buys is awesome. Mm -hmm. I mean, why, why would he buy anything that wasn't? But we, most of what we buy isn't the awesome stuff. The awesome stuff, it's all relative. So there's always, you know, I'm sure you could think about, even you look around your room right now, there's one or two things that really bring you joy and have always brought you joy and just you love. And every time you see it, you feel excited, you feel happy. And even your whole body language will change if I start asking about it. Like, tell me about that book or tell me about, you know, what's this, you know, heirloom you got from your travels or whatever it is. And you'll see people's whole expression change when they talk about it. Yeah. And then there's everything else that fills up our rooms where we don't even like we haven't even glanced at it or thought about it or remembered it. We purchased it and it just made its way on a shelf or under a bed or in a closet and got forgotten. So back to what you're mentioning with the mindfulness, it's just starting to get used to that idea of what are the few things that really bring me joy? And that's the high level mark mm -hmm. or sorry, the high water mark. So then when you look at things, is this going to make me ha as happy as X? Mm -hmm. Okay. And and so, the, so for kids, so I, I, if I'm thinking about my young boys, so my oldest, he loves fish. He's really into fish, his fish tank, and gets really excited about, you know, playing with the rocks within it and redecorating it and getting the different fish. And it's this thing that he gets really excited about. So mm -hmm. that's his awesome stuff. Mm -hmm. So then when he's looking at something else, like he sees a toy car or a box of Lego or something else, the question he asks himself, do I love, like, will I love this as much as I love my fish? Yeah. That's awesome. And even a young child can get that. And that's what's really neat because then they'll they'll make that decision. And there's no judgment. It doesn't matter what the decision mm -hmm. is. Yeah. That's where we as parents have to let some of that go. It's that they reflected on what's really important to them and and what their awesome stuff is. And and for everyone it's it's different. I mean, uh one one for me is travel. Mm -hmm. Like it doesn't have to be a thing. It's it's experiences and traveling with the family. There's there's very rarely a time where 
that wasn't money well spent for me mm-hmm. and that I, that I get really excited about. So that's my awesome stuff. So then when I'm looking at anything else, if I hold it up under that light, will I get as much joy as I do traveling with my family? Yeah. It puts I love it in that. perspective. Oh, I love that. That gives me the goosebumps. Yeah. Well, and that's, that's what it's supposed to do. Once you yeah. start feeling that you feel your body shift and get excited and that's what money should be. It shouldn't be this feeling of what do I want? I don't have it. And I feel just, Ugh. Mm-hmm. it should be something we're excited about. And, and that's sort of, once that's the first step, then we can get into the saving, the habits, how to make more, all these other things. But even that usually it doesn't require math. It's just habits. Yeah. Oh my goodness. That's awesome. I love it. And it's so, it's really putting, yeah, it's just so interesting. Like it's just flipping around how we learn about money and it just makes so much more sense. So I'm really excited and I'm really excited to get your book. When does it come out? So that's the unfortunate part is because of all this going on with COVID and supply chain issues, everything's delayed. So the book's fully written. It's ready. It's with the printer. We're looking at it probably coming out uh, early uh, 2022. So, so I think we're looking at maybe like a March, March, April official release. Mm -hmm. I'm hoping fingers crossed it actually gets to the distributor even earlier, but again, everything's, everything's backed up, Yeah. but it's, but it is coming soon and uh, you can pre-order it now. Um, I've also started doing some fun readings with it as well, live readings and mm. people sort of finding other ways that people can start accessing the book and the material and information yeah. before we get the hardcover in, in everyone's hands. Yeah. Okay. That's awesome. So where do you do the readings? Where can people find that information and also pre-order the book? Yeah. So the book's called The Golden Quest and the website is theawesomestuff.com. Awesome. So. That'll be easy to remember. (laughs) Yes. Easy to remember. And that's where the whole thing's built around is this idea of the awesome stuff Mm -hmm. and, and only buy the awesome stuff. Mm -hmm. And as you said, that's the flip, that's the, that's the flip that I'm trying to create. And that's, so that's the first lesson in the book. And then from there, then it starts building into habits. But what I found is it's so much easier sort of having those habits. Like we all know about you know, saving and compound interest, at least at a very, you know, surfacey level. Yeah. But sticking to those habits, it's really hard, especially if we haven't really thought about the why. If the why is just, you know, for that handbag or that car, or that watch, but it doesn't really get us excited. Mm-hmm. It's a little trickier. But if that why was, oh, I want to, you know, take a month off with my children or, yeah something along those lines, it makes it a lot easier when you know what that is to, to get into those healthy habits. And so that's why that's the first step. And so back to the saving, if saving doesn't have that first key step, then what happens is saving is just, we get very good at saving, but we never have enough and we're never happy. Yeah. That's a huge thing. Cause you know, you have your savings account and then after you like save up for that thing and then you get that thing or whatever it is. Like we had a home improvement project recently where we, you know, saved up and now we have like this beautiful patio and alleyway and like, you know, everything, but then we're like, okay, now we need to, you know, do the next thing. And of course our house currently is our awesome stuff because it makes us happy and um, we love remodeling it. But at the same time, there's always like the next thing, the next thing, you know, like we're talking about bathrooms and kitchens and, and all of that stuff. So it's just never ending. Yeah. Well, that's what I was going to ask is when you finish that, that patio, how soon in that process were you already thinking of what, what you wanted to buy next? Oh yeah. Like halfway, you know, halfway through when it was halfway done. Like, I think that next we should, you know, like extend the sidewalk down the, down the middle of the yard and, and all that kind of stuff. So, oh yeah, it's already like immediate when you're in that project. Yeah. And, and then what happens by doing that, it takes away from actually enjoying those things. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So the whole, the whole idea is trying to just sit on like, this is what I really want. Mm-hmm. So as you mentioned, like even thinking about the reno and the house, 
if you go a step further, not just the physical elements of it, but what about the house makes it your awesome stuff? What do you, what are your fond memories of the house? What makes you get lit up and excited? Mm-hmm. And, and I'm sure you can start, you're, you're picturing in your mind some moments with, you know, the family, maybe run a fireplace or on the patio, having a dinner and all these things. And as you start realizing that's what the awesome stuff is to you it's not the patio it's those moments Mm -hmm. then you start focusing on how do we create those moments rather than just keep building on the house yeah oh that's a good one that's really and you you can still do both it's just it's just pausing and sitting in it a little bit Mm -hmm. because otherwise uh, like I don't I don't want to be the person to tell you but your house will never (laughs) <laughs> it'll never get where you want it to be and I if it know. does there's another house down the road mm-hmm. on a better piece of land that's probably would be the next thing yes yeah, so. exactly yep and this house is 121 years old so it's definitely always going to need something so there's never <laughs> there's never going to be a time when it doesn't <laughs> so yeah I totally agree so I have a question for you that is kind of off topic but also kind of on topic um for adults, business owners, how do you feel about the profit first method of accounting? Are you familiar with that? No, it sounds okay. intuitive. Mm-hmm. Give me a quick rundown. I think I could pick yeah. this up fast. Or... Okay. Um, so basically you kind of estimate how much of, you know, each of your um, expenses or like you estimate how much your um, contractor pay is. You estimate how much your taxes should be. Um, you estimate how much your owner's draw should be. You estimate your expenses, your um, all of those things. And then you set up different checking accounts for them. And then you also have your taxes and your profit account at a different bank. And then um, you basically set these percentages and every penny that comes into your business, you literally just percentage it out into those accounts. And then, you know, you have, you always have enough money for everything in the right place. And you're also saving profit and you're also saving for your taxes. So, yeah. So for me, so as you're describing that, it rem- uh, make sure, I just want to make sure I have this right. Mm-hmm. A key element of this is that profit itself is built into your budget Mm -hmm. yep yes exactly yes and and i would highly agree to something like that i mean as entrepreneurs it's way too easy for us to just run so tight and put everything into the business yes and there's never anything there and so the same thing with uh with saving um i recommend saving first as well Mm -hmm. because once you do that the rest does fall into place. Like we're very good at managing what we have Mm -hmm. and also spending (laughs) what we have. Yes, exactly. So if we don't force that somehow, it will go somewhere else. Yeah. So if I think of like any of your projects, your clients or things, if you don't force yourself to pay yourself what you're worth Mm -hmm. for that time or the profit you want to generate, you'll find somewhere else to spend it. It could be marketing. It could be, oh, we've got a little bit more margin. So we could do a little bit more here than I thought we could, Mm -hmm. or maybe splurge here with, you know, whatever, some new software that we don't really need, but we want, Mm -hmm. it is so easy. And it's just, it's human nature. Yeah. And, and that's the thing is when I, when I talk about habits being a big part of it, habits is, habits is what really makes all this happen. And we, we can't force it without good habits. Yeah. I mean, trying to think that you'll, you'll magically find that profit eventually if it doesn't get built in as a habit is, yeah. is almost impossible. It takes a very strong willpower and very few people that that is their strength. Yeah. So, I so have yeah. noticed that since I switched to it and I switched to it in July, like everything has changed. Like it's been amazing. Cause I don't have that like stress of like, Oh, you know, Oh, I spent that on this. Oh, I needed this. And I didn't realize this was coming out and all that stuff. And now it's just like, ah, it's all where it should be. And it does it automatically. And I don't have to think about it. So, um, yeah. yeah. Well, if you're finding that works, I'd highly recommend applying that same strategy mm-hmm. towards your savings mm-hmm. because the savings, once that habit starts building up, 
we all hear about compound interest, but we don't really realize how fast that grows because when we're watching it closely, when it first starts, it isn't growing that fast. Yeah. It grows faster and faster over time. And we always feel like we have more time, but that starting early and getting the ball rolling and getting that happening is so important and, and it's a habit. And yeah. it's the same thing when you first, like if I told you right now at the end of your month, cut 20% or cut 10% and save it, it would yeah. be almost impossible. And you mm -hmm. would feel, you would really feel that pain. Yeah. But if you started getting the habit of that was just right off your paycheck from the very beginning, it was gone. You didn't, didn't even see it and it was put away. Mm -hmm. It would take very little time for you get to, for you to get used to spending what you have. Yeah. And, and not even realizing that's happening. Yeah. And, that's awesome. And so, yeah, apply that same strategy to saving for sure. Okay. Awesome. Yeah. I will do yeah. that. I love that. Yeah. Well, and when we talked to, just real quickly, when we talked at the very beginning about math, mm -hmm. we think about math and we, then we think about budgeting and we right. think about figuring out all our expenses and coming up mm -hmm. with a little budget. Nobody likes that. It, mm -hmm. it sucks. It's boring and it never works. Uh, and that's why thinking about money is so painful. Whereas the paying yourself first, this idea of the, you know, save first, put it away. Don't worry about the budget. You'll automatically spend what you have. Mm -hmm. And people are pretty good at working within that. Yeah. Uh, and that's, that's, that's a solution to budgeting is save first. And, yeah. and then everything else can come after that. Yeah. And, yeah. and we'll, and we'll spend less. I mean, it's very easy for people to think about, okay, Think about yourself five years ago when you're making a little less. Mm -hmm. What did you buy? Like, how did you survive when you're making less? Yeah. And you don't even know what you've spent the new things on. But as soon as you got more money to spend, you easily you spent just, it. Yeah. You just spent it. Yeah. You just spent it. I agree 100%. Our mortgage is about $500 less per month than our rent was um, at our last house. And I'm like, okay, so where did that $500 go? Like, where is it? I can't find it anywhere. <laughs> so it's kind of funny, but yeah. So let's talk about your, um, so your book is coming out very soon and people can go to the awesome stuff.com and are your appearances there? I just want to make sure that they're there as well. Um, so I've, I've got a blog on there that I talk about some, some of the recent podcasts right now. I'm just sort of building that, that side of things up and mm -hmm. getting out and talking to people about it. And I've been focused on production and because of COVID, I haven't really been creating a book tour, but yes, everything will, will be there. Um, awesome. as we start getting some, some upcoming events and, and I absolutely love like getting in front of the kids and talking to them. Mm -hmm. It is so fun. Uh, especially because most of the stuff that I focus on the first step is mindset. And for young kids, they, they don't have the same sort of beliefs that we do because they're, they haven't, they haven't been taught these things. Yeah. So they, they get it so quickly and, and it's so fun to see how it just makes sense to them because yeah. they've never known any different. That would be really cool to have you like zoom into different classrooms for like a reading or, you know, that kind of thing of the book. I think that would be awesome. Yeah, no, it's, it's so fun. And, yeah. and seeing what the kids notice as well is really cool mm -hmm. because they notice different things or they'll start zooming in right on like photos or, or pictures. Like I know there's a, a scene with a little dog and he jumps up and the boy jumps up and the boy has a little shadow under him, but the dog doesn't. The kids are like, What's shadow, what's going on? And they, <laughs> they pick up on these little minutia, which yeah. is really cool because it just shows that they're engaged. And then they add, and some of their questions like, why did the boy do that? Or why? Why was he asking this question? That doesn't make sense. And it's, mm -hmm. it's just so fun. Yeah. So fun to see. That's awesome. They're yeah. curious minds. I love it. Exactly. Well, thank you so much, David, for sharing your um, knowledge, your in inspiration. And I am very excited to get the book for my girls and um, any other kids that I know. So. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Amanda. And, and yeah, next time you're doing those rentals, just, just sit on it a bit and and realize why, what, what am I getting out of this? And then have those little celebrations with the family and, yeah. and really relish in that. I mean, yeah, I agree. I think we're all, we also missed out on the celebration part. We're like, okay, it's done. Like, you know, but then like, we don't actually like take the time to like literally celebrate that particular thing. So I love and that. actually back to talking about the kids about money, 
mm -hmm. you could bring them in on that. Like, yeah. this is what we're thinking of spending. This is why we're thinking of this deck. We want to do this with the, you know, mm -hmm. we thought this would be fun. And these are some things we thought would be good about it and get their input and just involve them. Yeah. And then they'll start seeing what, why you make certain decisions financially. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, that's perfect. Yeah. Yeah. I love it. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, David. Uh, looking forward to the book. Yes. I'm really excited to, to get that out there too. And, and yes, uh, it was so fun talking to you today, Amanda. You too. Thank you. Thank you for listening to the Determined Mom Show. We appreciate you and we would love for you to leave us a review on Apple Podcasts. This will help us reach as many other moms as we can. Don't forget to download your 10 things you should be doing to get more clients from Google search guide at rebrand.ly forward slash Google 10.